Hey everyone, welcome to session 101 of the Behavioral Observations podcast. In today's episode, Dr. Missy Olive and I talk about a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and that's consulting in public school settings. Longtime listeners will recall that I did an episode on this topic back in January of 2019, and since then, I've received numerous listener requests to return to this important issue. My colleague Jen Ferris saw Missy speak at a conference a few months ago, and she insisted that I reach out to her and get her on the show. And so I'm very grateful for this recommendation, as this episode is chock full of great information for those of us who practice in this area. Missy is the Executive Director of Applied Behavioral Strategies, an organization whose mission is to assist individuals to achieve their potential to live independently and with dignity. We spend the first part of the podcast talking about Missy's background and the unique way she found herself into our field. I won't repeat it here, but let's just say that Missy is clearly an early adopter of ABA. Whether you work in schools or not, I think you're really going to like this episode, as there are tons of lessons for practitioners that are, in my opinion, broadly applicable. If you'd like to learn more about special education law or conducting functional assessments in school settings, she has a few webinars coming up. There's a Special Education Law and Ethics for BCBAs webinar. That's being held on December 5th, 2019. And on December 12th, she is teaching ethical issues related to developing behavioral intervention plans. Missy has graciously offered a huge discount to podcast listeners. These webinars are normally $80, but she's offering these to podcast listeners for $25. Yes, that's right, $25. So uh, anyway, during the interview, we mentioned tons of other resources. I was furiously scribbling notes the whole time. So you'll definitely want to check out the show notes for session 101 over at behavioralobservations.com. And this podcast is brought to you by the following, the University of Cincinnati Online. For more information on the programs that they offer, for your training in behavior analysis, go to behavioranalysisuc.online for more information. We're also brought to you by HRIC. If you're looking for your dream job, you're going to want to contact HRIC. Work with the owner directly, Barb Voss, and let her put her 30 years of recruiting and placement experience to work for you. She's looking for BCBAs and positions all over the United States, so go to hricolorado.com for more information. We're also brought to you by the OBM 2.0 Pro Social Teaming Model Workshop, which will be taught by Drs. Darnell Latal and Tom Sabo. It's being held on January 18th and 19th at the Green River Community College in Auburn, Washington. Visit connections-behavior.com forward slash events for more information. And be sure to use the discount code PODCAST25. And lastly... We're brought to you by the Innovation and Education BCBA Consultation and Schools Annual Webinar. This year's event will feature podcast favorites such as Drs. Linda LeBlanc and Merrill Winston. Merrill will start off the day by talking about the ethical considerations of restraint usage, and Linda will focus on mentoring and other supervision and management practices. For more information, go to swwc.org forward slash workshops and save 10% on your registration by using the promo code PODCAST. All right, I think that's enough in terms of opening comments. So without any further ado, please enjoy this fun conversation with Dr. Missy Allen. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Dr. Misty Olive, thanks for joining me today on the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm so honored. Thanks for having me. The pleasure is all mine. I have been looking forward to this episode, this interview, this conversation for quite some time now uh, because we're going to talk about a topic near and dear to my heart, that's school consultation. Uh, it's something we haven't really talked a lot about. We've had a couple of episodes on it, and I, 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 I did the, the only solo episode uh, in, the, in the catalog of, of behavioral observations episodes uh, on school consultation. Um, but it's, it's something that 
a lot of listeners have emailed me and messaged me, hey, can we do more on that? Can we do more on that? So when I put out the call for questions, I got bombarded. So I want to just give That's a shout so out exciting. to all my awesome listeners who uh, you know, did a lot of the heavy lifting for me in terms of uh, interview prep. And uh, man, did we get tons and tons of questions. Uh, so many, so we couldn't get to them all. So I'm just going to kind of apologize in advance. But I think we have a variety of questions that address a lot of different facets of consulting to schools. So again, Misty, thanks so much for joining me today. Let's get started by uh, uh, talking about how you got into ABA. How, wh how did you discover behavior analysis? Uh, how did you decide this is something that you want to pursue as a career? And kind of take us up to kind of what you're doing these days. So, you know, Matt, when we were talking, you and I have been certified as behavior analysts for a long time, right? Are you my, <laughs> We are definitely old, but my ABA experience goes even further back than when I was certified. So my 40-year-old um, sibling was born in 1979, and within a few months, my mom recognized that there was something wrong with him. And, you know, this was before the days of internet and, and, and connectivity. And so she um, searched and searched and found a parent training um, program about 45 minutes from our home in a rural town of Tennessee. And so there were five of us. So she would load us all up into the car, schlep us up to Columbia, Tennessee, where she was taught ABA methods from other parents. It was called a parent training parent model, and it was actually started by Phil Strain and Matt Tim. So if you go back and read their um, publications on RIP, the Regional Intervention Program, you might find reference to my family in there. And so um, as a sibling, they caught on that, you know, I was fairly good with kids. And so they immediately started bringing me into the sessions and teaching me how to do things. And so... We would go for three hours, um, three days a week, and then we had homework that we had to do every day. The homework was, shockingly, ABA. So we had to do discrete trials. We had to take data. Um, and, you know, my brother did not enjoy the work. The work is hard. Um, but that was my first introduction to ABA, and I've been hooked ever since. Oh, my gosh. So this is like back in the, the 80s, basically, right? pre low boss. Wow, that's that's amazing, and and it's a you know you think of some of the birthplaces of ABA, and you know maybe it's just my provincial New England perspective, but you know Tennessee doesn't jump to mind, and I don't mean to say that disrespectfully or anything like that, but you think of like Kansas, you think of like you know uh, Los Angeles, Florida, all these kind of you know the the Boston area, you know, and you think of all these bastions of of, of early work and, and behavior analysis, so it, it, it's amazing that you guys were able to find these services and, and these people who are, uh, and as you say, in rural Tennessee, that's, yeah, I, I'm just marveling at that. So that's, that's a, quite a, quite a find. So, um, so you were hooked from the get go. From the beginning. Wow. Wow. That's cool. That's super cool. And so, so let me just elaborate too, how I got to my love for schools. My mom sort of modeled for me, this notion of advocacy. And when my brother was four, the new special education law had just been implemented, right? So the law, the law passed in the late seventies and states were very slow to actually implement. And so when he turned four, he was legally allowed to go to school. And so the parent training program had trained my mom to get him enrolled in school as early as possible. So my mom said, we're going to keep going there for three days a week, and then he's going to come to school for two days a week. And the director of special education said, oh, we don't take four-year-olds. And so my mom hung up the phone, and she called the state director of special education. And within minutes of hanging up from that call, the local called her back and said, oh, we must have had a misunderstanding. We do take four-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of my love for also advocating for the rights of individuals with disabilities. Wow. Um, it, just the adv advocacy topic alone, we could probably spend a couple of episodes talking about. But, uh, so, but it, it, obviously, these early experiences seem to be very formative for you. So, um, so as you kind of matriculated through like your 
kind of early education and, you know, started thinking about going to college, were you, you know, ABA all the way, were you seeking out training opportunities in this area? Uh, did you consider other fields, uh, perhaps like psychology or, you know, well, at least at that time, you know, according to my recollection, at least, you know, psychology was the only game in town. If you want to do behavior analysis, obviously it's very different today, but, um, Talk to us a little bit about some of the experiences with looking for training opportunities at the time. And again, I have to underscore this for folks who are newer to the field. The training opportunities in behavior analysis were, were, were few and far between. Uh, and uh, I think if you go back and listen to my first interview with Jim Carver, we were joking about the, the green book. There's this little thin green, a very, very thin, embarrassingly thin green workbook. If you, it'll look like a workbook and it had like, you know, the 18 behavior analysis, you know, places that you could study in the country. And most of them, there just happened to be one guy, you know, or, or, or one person uh, with, with a pigeon lab or something like that. Right. I yeah. see you nodding your head. So I'm, I'm cause like, we hadn't talked about this ahead of time, but it's always funny to kind of wax romantic about the wild and woolly days. Uh, so uh, tell me about your experiences finding training. Absolutely. So, um, behavior analysis wasn't a field at the time. Well, I mean, it was, but it was so small, you couldn't find it. And so I decided that I was going to be a special education teacher. And so I went to a, what's called a normal college, which back in the day, that was a school that traditionally had trained teachers. So Middle Tennessee State University was my first academic stop. And back then, again, I told you I was old. Back then, teachers were trained to do ABA. That was the teaching methodology that you used. And so, again, we used Alberto and Troutman for teachers. We learned how to collect data. We learned how to use um, prompting and prompt fading and reinforcement systems. That was the expectation. When I finished, and I'm really aging myself even more, when I finished undergrad, the idea had reauthorized. And so in that reauthorization of the special education law, they, um, back then it was not called idea, but when it reauthorized, they took the starting age for school down to age three, and they added a new program, which at that time they called Part H, so birth to three. And Vanderbilt University, who has long been a very ABA-based program, had a training program for people in rural areas to do birth to three. And so that initially sparked my interest at Vanderbilt. Um, I ended up going to Vanderbilt and focusing on early childhood special education and early intervention and uh, working with Dr. Ann Kaiser, who was Don Bayer's student. And so Ann taught um, us and we did research on how to use enhanced familiar teaching, um, which is an ABA-based language intervention. Um, from there, I decided I wanted to change the world and moved on to the University of Minnesota which has historically been, you know, top five program in training special education professionals. So I got my PhD um, in special education up there um, with a focus on positive behavior interventions and supports. Um, in fact, my program was funded through a PBIS grant for leaders in PBIS. And then from there, I um, started my first faculty position in um, University of Nevada, Reno, where I overlap with legends, and then moved on to the University of Texas at Austin, where I helped start um, the ABA program there. And then CARD, uh, led by Jonathan Tarbox at the time, moved me over to um, work in their program doing research. And another UNR connection, right? Another UNR connection. Jonathan was a student when I was at UNR. Oh my God. You know, I, I feel like, I feel like UNR owes me like a fruit basket or something like that. I think, I think my, 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 if you look at the catalog of episodes the, the we are disproportionately represented by folks with some connection to UNR. So uh, that is true. That is true. So, so that really um, immersed me into the world of ABA in the private industry. Um, so I stayed at CARD for a few years and then I launched Supply Behavioral Strategies. And uh, here we are, we are almost 10 years old and we're located in Connecticut and in Florida. Um, and we actually have school contracts and, and, and also successfully use insurance to provide ABA services in schools. 
Oh, cool. Well, we definitely have some questions on that sh for sure. So, um, and, and so uh, just in case anyone's, you're, you're, I think you're being modest. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit more real quick about where people can, um, if they're, if they want to run down your business and, you know, can either, I know you've got a variety of services if they're interested in consulting with you or interested in learning more. Is it, is it appliedbehavioralstrategies.com? Is that where people can? All right, cool. Uh, we will have that website listed in today's show notes. And you'll probably hear me say that like a million times. <laughs> so just Great. Make, away. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I mean, just more generally as we, as we list things, I'll, I'll, I'm making furious notes here. And so we'll, we'll for, for listeners who want more information on the stuff we talk about, just go to behavioral observations and we, um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try to capture as much as possible uh, in the show notes for this particular episode. So. And then if you don't mind, I would like to plug, um, I'm doing a four credit um, webinar on December 5th, um, specifically on special education law. And so people that want some additional information, I will give them um, enrollment for $25 if they uh, mention your podcast. Awesome. Awesome. Just writing down the details on that. We'll, we'll get the, the specifics. And, and again, I'll put that in the notes for today's episode. So that's uh, very kind for the discount too. Appreciate that. Um, all right. So boy, like I said, tons of questions about this. This is a topic that we have not paid enough attention to here on the podcast. So um, I, you know, usually what I do is kind of go back and forth uh, and, and, ask my own questions, but these listener questions are so good and so broad and, and, the, and, and the topics that they brought up that uh, I'm just going to kind of get right to them. And then we can kind of fill in the blanks of stuff that, you know, uh, that, you know, perhaps if there's a topic that doesn't get addressed through that, just uh, feel free to, to bring it up and uh, we'll just get going from there. So again, huge, huge thanks to the listeners who sent these in. So, um, let me start with this question. Uh, and in certain cases, we've redacted the names and places to protect the innocent. Um, so in certain cases, people have requested anon uh, to be uh, anonymous. Um, so um, so you, you'll hear that reference as such. So, uh, and the first question is uh, an example of that. So uh, name redacted asks, uh, I currently practice in location redacted uh, and have had to fight to get a place in the school districts. Any tips on how best to disseminate our science within education for people who don't know how to manage problem behavior? Also, any tips for accessing and advocating to the Department of Ed to help make changes in special education? Well, that's a big question. So let me start with, I think one of my biggest beefs with our field is that we have not really stopped to recognize the number of special education people who are behavior analysts who publish behavior and analytic work, right? So if we look at Maureen Conroy, Mark Woolery, um, Bill Brown, um, Sam Odom, Eileen Schwartz, I can go on and on and on at the, um, vast number of special education behavior analysts who don't necessarily have that credential of the BCBA, but their work is very behavioral. And if we want to enter into schools and get schools to buy into our science, we would first benefit from becoming fluent with the literature that has actually been done in schools. What would be a good source for folks to, you know, um, I'm, you know, so if, if, the, if the, their research is not being disseminated through like our, our typical quote unquote flagship publications, um, what, are some, what are some places people can look at on PubMed or wh wherever uh, in terms of other journals that, that feature this behavior analytic research, but focus on an applied, you know, educational setting? Absolutely. I, I would encourage our members to cross over into the Council of Exceptional Children, which is um, called CEC. And CEC has a lot of um, subdivisions, and those subdivisions include um, the Division of Early Childhood, um, Behavior Disorders, Research in Special Education, and each one of those sub subdivisions has its own journal. And so um, the Journal of Special Education publishes um, ABA Designs, um, the Journal of Early Intervention publishes ABA Designs, 
um, the Journal of Behavior Disorders also. So there's there are plenty of journals that actually have higher impact factors than Java who publish this um, great work. Can you just remind some, or some of the listeners might not be familiar with that term impact factor uh, for, because the large majority of behavior analysts out there are, are not in academia and that might be a foreign term to them. So I, I think that's worthwhile pausing on for a second because sometimes we think like, if it's not in Java, it's you know not important. But I think it's worthwhile underscoring the point that um, that there's such a broader audience out there. So can you, can you define that term and how it relates to those two camps? Absolutely. So an impact factor is a fancy math calculation to determine how often an article or journal is cited. And so if um, readers uh, go on and read an article and then they cite about it later, then that obviously increases the impact factor for that journal. So the more um, articles that a journal have, have that are cited by other sources um, increases the impact factor. And just to give you sort of a big picture, when you look at something like um, JAMA, the Journal of American Medical Association, they have an impact factor of like 50, right? So the number goes quite large. But when you look at the field of education, um, the highest ranked journal with um, uh, in the education field usually sits around an eight. So the readership and the citation levels are going to be less because there's less research happening in that area. Um, and so the Journal of um, Special Education Research and also the Council for Exceptional Children's um, Journal uh, called Exceptional Children, they're the leading special ed journals. Deciding to take the next step in your career is a big decision. Whether it's moving from a registered behavioral technician to a board-certified behavior analyst or learning how to apply behavior analysis within a school setting, the University of Cincinnati Online Behavior Analysis Program can be a rewarding way to advance your career. Gain cutting-edge marketability, knowledge, and skills to increase your earning potential all while improving the quality of life for others. The University of Cincinnati, a premier research and higher learning institution, ranks in the top tier of America's best colleges by U.S. News & World Report, and it's fully accredited through the Higher Learning Commission. So if this sounds interesting to you, please visit behavioranalysisuc.online for more information. I see. And those, those impact factors are higher than Java and behavior analysis and practice, etc. Correct. I see. Yeah, you know, I was, um, I, you know, I think my membership has lapsed. I'm going to confess here, uh, but I, I, I've uh, been a member of uh, CEC um, for, for many, many years, and I've gotten subscriptions to many of those journals. One of the things that's cool about that is that, um, I, I don't know if they still do this or not, but there's also, in addition to the journals, there's some very practitioner-friendly, like, magazine-type, it's kind of like a lighter version of behavior analysis and practice. Um, you know, and I forget, like one of them's called like beyond behavior and that's focused on an EBD type Correct. of population. Um, and that comes out of that set, that same subdivision for behavior disorders. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's another one. Um, it's like teaching exceptional children. Correct. So, you know, if listeners that's are, that's a flagship, that's a flagship practitioner journal for the whole organization. And so if you like early intervention, the, then the similar magazine is young, exceptional children that's put out by the Division of Early Childhood. Okay, all right. Yeah, um, and so that's one of the things I enjoyed about uh, being a, a member and things like that, because you get, you get some of these things that are more translational, more practitioner-focused, especially some of the, the not necessarily the journal-based publications, but I actually sometimes found more value in, in, the, in, the, in the things that were more about, like, focused on the, the actual teacher, you know, so... Um, I think it's a lesson for dissemination more, more generally as well, you know. Right. Well, I was going to say for, for any behavior analyst out there that want to dip into publishing, I think the review process in those types of um, journals are much friendlier um, than in a traditional research journal. Um, they still have impact factors. Um, they're still considered peer review because they undergo the same review, peer review process, but they're a little... Um, less stressful. It's a great way to get your feet wet in the publication world. 
Good deal. Good deal. So, um, so before we go on to the next question, Ken, I want to jump back to this whole notion of the Department of Ed. Yeah, yeah, please. So I'm a firm believer in your state association, right? So I'm on the board of directors for Connecticut, ABA, um, as I'm sure that you're involved in, in one of the um, organizations up in Massachusetts uh, or New Hampshire. I mean, everyone should line up with their state association and be active members. Um, all of those uh, chapters are run by volunteers, and um, the more volunteers that are help leading our field, the better. Um, each of those state chapters should have a legislative branch. So in Connecticut, we call it the um, uh, Public Policy and Legislative Outreach, so the PPLO Committee. And, and we actually have a lobbyist uh, at CTLBA, and we use that lobbyist to form those relationships. And so when you talk about the Department of Ed, right, that is who you want to um, have your state legislative group work with the Department of Ed and form that relationship so that they understand um, what is behavior analysis and, and why is behavior analysis in schools and help, again, bridge that gap um, from, from their world and our world. Very good. All right. So join up with your state association. That's a, that's a good advice. Um, um, all right. Another question that came up is um, uh, it was submitted by, by Val. Um, she asked, um, can you describe how you navigate support for students across IEP areas? For example, the differences between direct services and consultation services. And if that changes who a client is, uh, I, I think that whole question of what is a client, who is the client when you're consulting to a school district is, is huge. Um, she's a BCBA with a, uh, with a really large caseload servicing many buildings in a district. And I see that a lot just in my own practice. You know, a lot of times I'll consult to a district who already has a BCBA on, uh, on their staff, but who is stretched a, an inch thick and a mile wide. Um, that's a different issue, of course, but um, yeah, talk about the, 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 what, who, who is a client uh, and the different types of consultation, I guess, goals, arrangements, models, et cetera. So I want to first remind everyone that the BACB has given us a code of ethics, and that code of ethics has 10 main points, right? But I think people tend to forget there's a glossary at the end of our code of ethics. And that glossary defines client, which is a very broad definition, right? Um, it's whoever you're working directly with, plus their parent or legal guardian, plus anyone who is a recipient of those services, and plus the payer of those services in most cases, right? And so we have a very broad definition of who our client is, and we have to stop and think, who's our primary client? The, the code actually stipulates when you're not sure, you need to stop and assess who is the primary beneficiary of your services. And so when, when I am running the special education law webinar, we go through that step-by-step -step process. The second that you focus on Johnny, Johnny is now your primary beneficiary of services. Right, And if you're not focusing on Johnny and you're at the classroom level, then the teacher is your primary beneficiary of services. And I think as BCBAs um, find themselves employed in these districts, they need to remember that regardless of where they work, they still have to operate under the code. Sometimes districts are not aware of what our code states and they ask us to do things that are not in our scope of practice or that put us um, in charge of too many things that aren't behavior analytical. And so we have to keep that in mind. And I think the other thing that our field needs is a revision to the ASD practice guidelines. Um, I have begged and pleaded with Gina. I have begged and pleaded with Jim. Um, we need a document that guides services in schools. So my next beg, um, was to CAST, the Council, Council of um, Autism Service Providers. I would love to see them be the flagship for this is the way autism services are provided in schools so that we have those guidelines that tell us what is an appropriate caseload. So if we look at the BACB's ASD guidelines, 
They define services in two ways. They say focused services and they say comprehensive services, right? Where a focused service would be maybe you have one behavior plan that you're working on with that kid, or maybe you're pushing in to work on toileting, or maybe you're pushing in to work on feeding, right? Whereas a comprehensive plan is what I think of as an EIBI program, Mm -hmm. or perhaps an older student who still needs those comprehensive services um, because maybe they are progressing, you know, uh, rapidly and they just haven't um, been completely included. So if we think about what the board says about that, the board also talks about caseload and recommended caseload. And this is how many clients you should have if you're doing focused services. And this is how many clients you should have if you're doing comprehensive services. So what's not in the guideline is the word consultation, right? The the service of consultation is not listed by the board as an ABA service. And so we, we need to define what consultation is so that we can pinpoint who is our primary beneficiary of services, who is our client, who all are we responsible to? Well, uh, yeah, I think those those uh, clarifications would be helpful because we do get put in all sorts of strange situations and strange requests and things like that. One of the things, uh, we, we might get this a little bit later, but it just occurred to me now, so I'm bringing it up, but it, it, at least my experience consulting in schools is that school personnel are... are, are uh, there's a lot of things that they have to attend to that we don't, um, and, and the opposite is true, you know. And so, from their perspective, they're just trying to solve problems, and they don't know about or or care about what our obligations are underneath the the ethics code. Uh, and I think the way in which you know behavior analysts are being trained to practice these days, particularly in the context of insurance funded services. Uh, it's, it's just, ent- it's a completely different animal. And even things like consent, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've been in a school and say, Hey, while you're here, can you take a look at this guy? You know? And it's like, I, I often talk to parents, uh, excuse me. I often talk to teachers and, or, or, or principals or whatever and say, well, what if your child was in school and you learned after the fact that some stranger with a visitor tag on was observing your child and the teacher was pontificating on all the the problems that your child was engaging in and giving away all sorts of information and oh yeah and then they're showing you the the IEP or the 504 or the behavior referral document you know and it's just so the whole concept of consent is there it they you know my experience now I'm hoping it's different elsewhere in some districts you know uh uh thankfully do a better job than, than, than others, but man, it's just, a, it, I feel like I'm, I'm doing education on that all the time. What, 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 what's your experience with that? Identical. Okay. I call it drive by I'm ABA. not alone. <laughs> you are not alone. It, seriously, we cannot do drive by ABA. And it's, yes, parent consent is probably the most important thing, but let's not forget our code also stipulates that we have to have a contract for professional services. And so you cannot go in and talk about Johnny if you don't have a contract for Johnny's services. And so Johnny's contract would either be his 504 or his IEP, right? And and so we we have to stop the drive-by ABA and, and come back to our roots and our ethical requirement, which is get parent consent and have that contract outlined. Now, again, if you're following a PBIS model, which I believe we all should be doing in schools, then you can make class-wide recommendations to the teacher that will benefit all the children in the class. And I think Stephanie um, Peterson has a lovely article that came out in BAP maybe a year ago, um, and she um, published this tool that you can use when you go into classrooms to look at are the basic things happening in that class. So what's the point of doing an FBA and an individualized behavior plan if you don't have the the proper supports happening at the class-wide level? And so her article is a great place for people to start. And I can get you that full reference um, after the show. 
Um, but that, that's a great place to start with a tool that you can use when, when a teacher does ask you to do drop by, then you can come in and look at the class and then make recommendations at the class wide level. Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a great kind of, it's, it's sometimes good to have these kind of, uh, rejoinders or, or responses to those uncomfortable requests uh, at the ready. So yeah, being able to say, you know what, I can't do that, but I can, I can still be helpful in this way. Uh, I think that's, that's really good advice. So I appreciate that suggestion. Can I just away my other beef? Um, yeah, you know? let's air the grievances. <laughs> let's do it. So our code, you know, defines clients. Our code also defines multiple relationships. And I think sometimes when we're practicing in school, whether we're hired by the, by the district or whether we're contracted by the district, it, I think that behavior analysts are put in situations that might lend themselves to form multiple relationships, right? So you get invited to the baby shower, you get invited to the happy hour, you get invited to these um, situations where you are not engaging in behavior analytic services. And the code is very clear. A multiple relationship is when you when you are in both a behavior analytic relationship and a non-behavior analytic relationship. And so I think we all have to, you know, again, come back to our code and, and remind ourselves that we should not be going to happy hour with the people that we're providing ABA services to. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, that's, uh, that's good advice. Um, all right. Let's, uh, so if, if other things come, come up in our discussion, like I said, feel free to, bring those up. Cause I think those are real, uh, th th those beefs I think are, are indicators of, 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 of issues that, that people encounter commonly. So, um, so let's move on, uh, real quick. Uh, another anonymous writer as a long time. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm reading the question here as a long time practitioner in Connecticut, I've found the Connecticut department of ed to be anti-behavioral. I've also found school systems that may contract for a BCBA, but the teachers resist behavioral advice and actually argue with you about the behavioral approach. I've had that happen too. It boils down to having an FBA for the file about, you know, um, let me just interrupt the question here real quick. That happens to me all the time, uh, especially around the, the, when it comes to the, the magical 10 days of a student being suspended. It's like, well, we need an FBA. And when you dig, start to dig a little deeper, it's like, well, yeah, they're interested in solving the problem, of course, but they really need the FBA to check a box in the, in these either special education or some, some other type of, you know, uh, ed, ed law process. So that's just my own little editorial there. All right, let me continue with the question here. Um, it boils down to having an FBA for the file. Has your practice found this to be true? And if so, how do you deal with it? Also, how do you deal with the entrenched opinion in schools that for autism, Sensory integration and sensory diets are such an important part of programming, even though there is no evidence that they do anything. A lot to unpack there with that question, but. A lot to unpack. And I, I do have to say that um, I do know this person because, as you know, the name was submitted and then redacted, right? And so I'm going to just do a quick hello, shout out, colleague, friend in Connecticut. I know, I know you and I feel your pain. Um, <laughs> So Connecticut has a, a very interesting history, right? So um, behavior analysis has been happening in schools here for, for many years. Um, in fact, this, you don't have to look far to read about Stacey Lohr, who was a person who pretended to be a doctoral level BCBA. She didn't even have a um, college degree. And so... She had all these contracts with all these very wealthy school districts down near New York. And we have no idea, you know, the, the damage that she did by um, this falsification of services. Um, but she did get caught. And what resulted is Connecticut uh, came up, you know, with a law that prevented um, people from pretending to be behavior analysts. But then shortly thereafter, we had a new law added that specifically stated that any child with an IEP who had ABA in IEP would then have to be supervised by a BCBA or equivalent. And they defined the equivalent, I think, pretty well. Um, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, Suzanne Letta led that, uh, the language on that bill. Okay. And so that was a good thing for us. 
except that school districts um, sort of changed what they were doing. So when I moved to Connecticut in 2009, and one of the things that I noticed right away is that Connecticut IEPs have ABA as an other service, just like speech, just like OT, right, as a related service. And so kids would have a separate line item for their ABA. And when that law passed, what I saw was this big sweeping change in the IEPs and that kids no longer had that service listed in their IEP, but rather they had this sort of comment and asterisk down at the bottom of their document that said, child will be in, an a, in a classroom that uses ABA methodology. Mm. As that sounds that, very vague. It, it is very vague, but it also, I think, the attorneys advising the school districts I think led the districts to believe that they would be free from having to have that, that BCBA supervision. So since then, that passed in 2012. So since then, what we've seen is districts are hiring BCBAs more and more in our state, which is great. Yep. Um, but yeah, we've seen that here in New Hampshire too. Uh, yeah, exactly. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the teachers have buy-in. And I think part of that goes back to, again, in the dark ages when I was trained, ABA is what we were taught to do. It was the expectation. But now, with the constructivist approach, um, you don't see teachers learning that ABA is a methodology talk. Um, and, I, and then again, it circles back to my points at the beginning of our talk, which is how, how can we read their, the journals that they're supposed to be reading and practicing and help bridge that gap? And, and, and I think it means, you know, we have to water down our language. We have to um, come with them with that open-ended question, like, how can I help you um, and, and approach it maybe from a slightly different way? I mean, we have a really good working relationship with the district where we're contracted to provide services. Um, I meet with the assistant director, with we, director weekly to ensure that we have that continuity and to make sure that our BCBAs are not overloaded with cases. Um, and then the BCBAs have just learned that you have to approach the teachers because they're the expert in their classroom and they will tell you what they need. And then we have to show them both with data and by modeling. You know, one of the things the director said to me was your BCBA think to put their computers down and get on the floor with these teachers and these kids. If you own or help manage an ABA company of any size, you may want to listen closely to this. According to a recent 2019 nationwide survey, average turnover for behavior technicians has been over 50% in the last three years. The cost to a company of any size to replace half of their staff year over year can be the difference between viability and failure. Staff turnover, stalled initiatives, and the tendency for an individual to focus on their own benefits at the expense of the group, these are some of the large-scale challenges that threaten a company's potential to thrive. And if you're looking to grow a company, accomplishing this growth without sacrificing the quality of your services can seem daunting or even impossible. If you've encountered these problems in your own professional life, either as a company owner or an employee responsible for management of teams of people, or if you're thinking about starting a company of your own and you want to make sure that the company is built to thrive sustainably, then take a few minutes to introduce yourself to the pro-social model for group design and management. ProSocial is a set of evidence-based principles, techniques, and tools combining very recent research from psychology and behavioral science, organizational behavior management, economics, and evolution science. The ProSocial framework starts with the way humans evolve to work together in small groups, which is based on the Nobel Prize-winning research of economist Eleanor Ostrom in her eight core design principles for effective groups. The practices within the pro-social model are further informed by organizational behavior management and acceptance and commitment training. If this sounds like something you might want to learn more about, Connections Behavior Planning and Intervention is offering a two-day intensive workshop with world-class presenters, Drs. Darnell Latall and Tom Sabo. The workshop is being held near Seattle, Washington on January 18th and 19th, 2020. For more information, visit connections-behavior.com forward slash events. Registration is limited. And enter the code PODCAST25 for a $25 discount off of your registration. Ooh, that's really good advice. I've been guilty of that. 
<laughs> to be honest. Um, so yeah, for sure. You know, I think uh, one of the things I try to do in these situations is just to kind of um, not take myself too seriously, you know, cause I think we have, you know, we want to, you know, and I, I think some of our training in some circumstances creates this, you know, uh, you know, we're the best, you know, uh, you know, when I interviewed, uh, Adele Nadowski, um, a while back, you know, she talked about when she got out of graduate school that she, you know, in her own words, she's like, I felt like I was a badass, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and if you go into schools with that, that mindset, you know, you're not going to get taken seriously, you know? Um, and, and so it's, it's taken me a while to kind of figure out how, how, how to connect with people. And, uh, you know, it, there's, you can turn people off really easily. Um, and, and even with sensor, even with, yeah, we, we could, you can be right or you can be effective, you know? And so, you know, the whole sensory integration thing, you know, I, I, you know, I've, I've, I've been guilty of, saying, Hey, you know, that's, that's not a productive use of time and things like that. You know, and, and some, the, the more, I, more I practice, the more and more I, I try to like, I'll try to just like work around it. Yes, this is going to happen. How can we, and how can we continue to make headway? How can we prevent these interventions from, from being problematic? You know, so the areas I will put my foot down is like, okay, someone's having a problem behavior let's get them to the, hurry. Let's get them to the swing. That's where I'll like say, no, no, you shall not pass. You know, but I, I try to look at that as some sort of, you know, maybe some sort of fixed time reinforcement, you know, uh, you know, if someone's on like a, a sensory diet, that's the kind of work around that I've found. Um, obviously we'd prefer them to be doing other things with that time. Um, but I don't know. I hope that, I hope that's helpful. Um, well, actually I do. I want to tell you what we do and it has been very helpful. Um, so for starters, like who wouldn't want a good massage? I love going to get my nails done and getting my massage. And so I, I think it's hard to argue that kids don't want to be rubbed on or don't want to be brushed on. Right. But what we have to ask ourselves is what's the outcome of that and how can we measure the outcome of that? So whenever a professional asks us to do something that we don't philosophically agree with, our first question is, how is that going to change the child's behavior? And we listen, right? We have to stop and we have to listen to what they have to say. And so then we say, great, we're going to measure that for just a couple of days. And then we would like for you to start your intervention, right? So we get a baseline of this thing that the professional tells us is going to get better. And then the professional starts their intervention and we continue to track those data to see if, in fact, this intervention helps. You know, we did this with um, one of my little pumpkins. She was three. She had Down syndrome plus autism. And the OT wanted to do this brushing program. And so, again, we took our baseline. We started the brushing program. And my team had already told me that they didn't think it was working, right? But the mom called me. And she said, Missy, I don't think it's working. And I said, well, 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 tell me why you don't think it's working. And she said, well, she's falling asleep right after we do it. And I said, oh, well, that's really not going to be helpful for ABA. Um, but you have reported that she has trouble falling asleep at bedtime. So maybe we could change the timing of this service and do it right before she goes to bed. And so that's what we did. We flipped, we did her ABA and then ran her through her evening routine. We did a little brush down, we tucked her into bed and it fixed the sleeping problem. Right? Yeah. So, you know, it, again, it comes back to doing what we do best, which is measuring behavior and changing behavior. And if we use our data and listen to people, I think that we can, can get over some of these humps instead of going in and going, your intervention is not effective. Here, let me show you the research and let me show you my research. That is just not going to win friends at all. No, no, no. I often find too, I don't know if you encounter this, but a lot of people I run into aren't persuaded by data. No. You know, so like there's been a lot of, uh, you know, and, 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 and they, they, uh, it's almost like some intervention, like if you, you picture some sort of quadrant or whatever, it's like high social validity, 
here, if you had like something like, a, like I'm imagining this right now off the top of my head, so this might not come out all that great. But if you had like a two by two grid, if you will, where, where the dimensions were social validity and effectiveness, you know, like I think like sensory integration would have like high social validity because it looks, it's, it's, it's pleasurable. It's, it's, you know, the kid's smiling, they're happy, et cetera, you know, oftentimes. And then low effectiveness, you know, and so it sounds like you move that to a different quadrant of like, it's effective and socially valid, right? Um, but I think that social validity, perhaps, of, of, of these, these interventions masks all the ineffectiveness of them in, in, the, in the areas in which we'd like to see. And, any, and even showing people kind of pre and post data often sometimes is, is, is not convincing. No, but you know what is convincing? Videos. Families fall for those before and after videos. And that's those non-ABA or non-evidence-based treatments have very good marketing teams. And they're able to convince families that this is what's going to make it better for their kid. And, and we suck at marketing. Excuse my language, but we do. For sure. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, I mean, I think what really gets people's attention, though, is if someone's throwing chairs in the classroom, we can get that under control. And that's how we ultimately win friends and influence people. So, um, yeah. Um, so again, like so many of these questions, we can probably go on and on about that, but I want to move on to something else here that's kind of related. So I I got this uh, email from someone who works in the Nashville area. Um, and, and, they were so excited for this episode. They sent me like 15 questions because they met as a team. And I'm going to apologize in advance because there's so many questions. I can only select, you know, one of theirs amongst the, the gazillion questions I got. So, uh, but I wanted to get your guys' question in. And one of the questions I have is, uh, how do we accommodate restorative practice and other initiatives that are trending that may or may not be behaviorally sound? Yeah. So, um, again, we have to remember where we're practicing and, you know, we're not in our cute little ABA clinic where we have control of everything. We're in schools where the real world is happening. Um, and so restorative practice, right, is, is very popular in schools right now, but let's look at what is the purpose of restorative practice, right? In the education field, It's about repairing those relationships where people have been done wrong, right? And when we think about families who have a hard time coming to school, when we look back at their own educational history, they may or may not have been wronged by the system. And so they're hesitant to come in and form those relationships with their child's teacher because of that history. So that's one piece, right? We have to fix the families that we have done wrong. But I think as behavior analysts, we need to look at how we've potentially done teachers wrong Um, and how can we help teachers get that trust back in us. Again, they don't care about our data, Um, but what they do care about, as you said, is when we can stop the chairs from flying around in the classroom. And and so how can we um, take that step back, rebuild those relationships and help everybody remember we are all here for the same reason, and that is to help this kid get better. And so we, we need to be able to trust each other that we're all in it for the right reason. Yeah. Um, let's see. A couple other questions on school culture here. Uh, um, when, when should a school call in a BCBA? Um, so, you know, I, I've... I've and, and yeah, so let's just take it from that. I've got some other thoughts on that, but let's just, let's just take the question at, at face value there. So if, if, what, what are the thresholds, you know, cause I'm assuming this is coming from a standpoint of someone who is, you know, maybe try, maybe a teacher who's maybe has some training and they're trying some things, maybe they've gotten some additional training on doing functional assessments or, you know, if it's a more comprehensive approach, you know, maybe they've gone to like a, a VB map or a peak workshop or something like that. What are some signposts, if you will, or, or, or signs more generally that, that would tell a, a teacher or a, you know, an IEP team or something like that that they, they, need to, they need to call in a BCBA? So I feel like if we did a better job marketing what ABA is, 
we would be the people leading in-service training, right? So we would be training teachers from the get-go about the need for behavioral services and how those basic behavioral services look like in schools. And then the next most important place I think we should be is at the table for the support team meeting. So again, if you're implementing a true PBIS model, the school has a team of experts that meets regularly to review the children who may be struggling or help the teachers with the kids who may be struggling. And so BCBAs can participate in those meetings and help remind people to always think function, right? Children don't just throw chairs around the room. They throw chairs around the room because that behavior results in something that works for the child. And so helping teachers take that step back and, um, and assess before they actually have to take it to the, that third tier of intervention, which is an, an FBA and a, and a, and a BIP. Um, and then, you know, in, the, in a great school, they would have us on staff, just like they have a social worker, just like they have, um, you know, a speech and language pathologist and an OT, we would just be part of, of the team. So PBIS has come up a couple of times. So I'm gonna skip ahead to one question related to that in general. Uh, so Goldine asks, uh, can you speak to your experience with PBIS in schools and how that overlaps or supports behavioral consultation in these settings? Yeah, so again, I was trained in PBIS at the uh, PhD level. Um, my specialty is the individualized support. So when I was at UNR, I wrote my first um, research grant, which is looking at applying um, PBIS into early childhood homes and schools. Um, and so that's where I'm most fluent, but because we do, we do classroom consultation as part of our um, work, both with insurance funded services and also um, school contracted services, we've become very masterful at reminding teachers of the very strategies that they can do on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and I think the most exciting thing I'm doing right now, I decided to get the rust off and I, I'm teaching a class this fall. Um, I haven't taught in five years, and I'm teaching classroom behavior management um, to undergrads and postbacs who are going for that initial certification as a teacher in Connecticut. And, and I keep reminding them that their disposition can make or break it for a kid. And, and they seem to be hearing me, at, you know, whether they remember it when they're actually in the classroom, you know, but just helping them understand that the way that they respond to a behavior in the moment is either going to make that behavior better or worse. And to really think about it before they respond so that they choose a response that's going to make that behavior get better. I see. Wow. I'd love to see the... The curriculum on that. Um, that sounds like a great experience. <laughs> like those, uh, those, uh, those students are lucky for sure. Cause, uh, as I'm sure, you know, most of the time teachers don't get anything. It might be like a one class on behavior management out of the, you know, a four years of a teacher prep program or something like that. No, that is exactly what they get. They have or like one like class, one class within <laughs> like one, 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 one class, literally like one class. You know, it is, it's, it's one class and I'm supposed to teach them how to measure behavior, how to define behavior, how to do an FBA, how to write a bill, how to monitor progress and how to make educational decisions all in 45 hours. Wow. I know it's scary, but before you go to this next question, I do sure. want to um, jump back. The, the Connecticut friend of mine had made that comment, you know, that when BIPs get put in filing cabinets, you know, then they don't get implemented. Um, for those of you who are, who are in a train the trainer model, right? So you're a BCBA and you're training other people to do behavior analysis in school. I love a resource. Um, the, the cartoonist is called Michael Gian Greco, and I'll, and I'll send you his link. Um, he's also. Can you, say, can you just say that again, real quick, Michael? Sure. Michael Gian Greco, and he um, had, is the illustrator for a series of cartoons. He has a book called Ants in Your Pants and um, Flying by the Seat of Your Pants and a couple of others. But I, I got his handy dandy CD ROM, and so I downloaded all of his cartoons, and I use those when I'm training teachers because he takes this sort of tongue-in-cheek um, approach to cartooning about what we do in schools. And so he has a great one um, that is a filing cabinet. And it, um, he says it's you know supposed to be sung to the tune of born to be wild. But 
the, the cartoon is born to be filed. And it shows these dudes on their Harley and they're filing their IEP away. And, and so again, we know this is what, you don't cartoon about something that doesn't happen. Oh, you, for cartoon sure. about, you cartoon about things that do happen, but, but maybe by gently throwing that cartoon into a training, you help people understand that, um, that they shouldn't be tucked away. But I would also argue that 40 page IEPs and 20 page BIFs are not going to get implemented by team. Do you have questions about the ethical considerations when implementing emergency procedures such as restraint and seclusion? Do you want to learn best practices for supervising staff members? Are you free on February 4th, 2020? Great. There's an event that's coming up that's just for you. It's called the Innovation and Education BCBA Consultation in Schools Annual Webinar. And it's being put on by my friends from the Southwest West Central Service Cooperative. I did use the word webinar so the learning can come to you. This year's events features podcast favorites, Drs. Linda LeBlanc and Merrill Winston. Merrill will start the day off by talking about the ethical considerations of restraint usage, and Linda will focus on mentoring and other supervision and management practices. Earn your ethics and supervision CEs from two people who are at the top of their game in their areas of expertise. For more information, go to swwc.org forward slash workshops. Alternatively, you can just go to the show notes of this episode at behavioralobservations.com and I'll have a link there waiting for you. Lastly, save 10% on your registration by using the promo code PODCAST. So again, just to recap, check out the Innovation and Education webinar. It's being held on February 4th, 2020. And to learn more, go to swwc.org forward slash workshops. Oh, yeah, 100%. While we're on that topic, what uh, do you, how, do you, how do you balance the complexity of a plan of you know, knowing what a kid needs versus what a team is capable of pulling off, you know, uh, you know. So, for example, let's say there's a kid who requires a very careful kind of functional communication, tolerance training, intervention, um, but the sophistication of the staff is not there to be able to pull that off successfully, and so you might give them kind of you know. So, how how do you handle those types of situations? That's another thing I've been telling my staff, my, my team, uh, my students all semester, which is reinforce, reinforce, reinforce. We can train anybody to reinforce appropriate behavior. And if you can increase those just overall rates of reinforcement, then that's going to have a, a, an effect of decreasing the problem behavior. And, and so anybody can, can start there. And then once you get that, again, we talk about restorative practices. If you've been punishing a child repeatedly in your classroom and all of a sudden now you're going to start dishing out reinforcement, that child's not going to have buy-in until you have that relationship formed again. And so when you build that positive relationship or rebuild that positive relationship between the child and the teacher, then they begin to like each other and it becomes more a more natural process to, to dish out the reinforcement. How do you have you encountered, I've, I've encountered this kind of, I guess, profile or archetype or whatever you want to call it, but uh, the, the teacher who is very justice oriented as it relates to problem behavior, like, you know, obviously that's a foreign consideration for us as behavior analysts because we understand, you know, the, as Pat Freiman likes to say, the circumstantial view of life as opposed to the characterological interpretation of behavior. But that's not common, uh, unfortunately. And I, I run into administrators, teachers, et cetera, who are, you know, the, 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 the classic line I get, it's like, well, they should be doing this anyway, or, you know, they need a consequence. And what they're really saying is they need a punishment. You know, um, do you have any canned lines or, 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 or stories or examples to, to circumvent that like you, you have with some of these other topics that have come up? Sure. So I'm, I'm sure you won't be surprised. Michael Gian Greco has a cartoon for that. Oh, great. Um, it's, it's great. He shows this, you know, um, person that, that's actually holding a paddle, you know, totally embracing corporal punishment. And then, you know, the 70s teacher who's like, chill out, peace out. 
um, I, I, I do like to bring it back to, to sort of a, a comedic approach, which is it doesn't matter what your philosophy is. What we have to do is follow the law, right? And the law tells us that we need to use reinforcement um, strategies for these kids. And, and while you may feel that the need to punish is there, if we can focus on reinforcing, then we won't have a need to punish because those, those behaviors um, won't have an opportunity to be in the child's repertoire. Um, and, I, and I talk to them in layman's terms, you know, about, about behavioral economics. If we spend our whole day focusing on the positive behaviors, then there's very little time to engage in those problem behaviors. I see. Okay. Um, all right. One last question in this section here is, uh, what advice do you have for districts looking to hire BCBAs? Uh, Shelby asked this. <laughs> she, she just wrote, uh, they seem to be unaware of the specific details. Um, and boy, is that an understatement, Shelby. So thanks for submitting that question. Absolutely. And, and I would say the first thing we want to do is make sure that they um, access the code so that they understand you know, what principles we have to abide by. But then I would also make sure they have a copy of our ASD um, practice guidelines so that they understand our science and the tiered model of service delivery and what is an appropriate caseload. But I also, and please forgive me, those of you who may get your feelings hurt, a green BCBA needs additional supervision. Um, the, the BCBA is an entry level credential and it by no means prepares you to the complexities of the work in schools. So unless you were trained extensively on providing ABA as a service in schools, you really need to think twice before you accept a job in a school district, particularly if that district does not have supervision for you by a senior level BCBA. And I think that's the big challenge is to help districts understand that this BCBA credential is an entry level credential and that they probably haven't had any time with kids who have emotional behavior disorders. They probably haven't had much experience actually working with teachers and parents and, and we can't jump them into these roles without that ongoing support that they need. And, you know, earlier, Matt, we were talking about the, um, the graph at the BACB that shows the exponential rise in, in BCBAs over mm -hmm. the years. And the other scary part of the, those data are that half of all of our BCBAs were credentialed in 2016 or later. Yeah. So that means that over half of our BCBAs are still babies and probably don't have the scope to really work with these complex problems in schools. I don't think I could add anything to that. that, was, <laughs> that was really, yeah, that's I'm sorry if I hurt people's feelings, but just because you're BCBA does not mean that you know how to do it all. Right, right. Yeah, I've made that recommendation to special education directors uh, as they're, you know, um, looking to hire people. Um, and, and I've tried to... Tried, I've tried to uh, make the directors aware of the need for ongoing training and again, mentorship as you, you know, so rightly point out. So I think um, yes to all those points. Right? I would strongly agree. So, uh, so you mentioned working with staff. Uh, so let's move on to this next section here. Um, staffing is a different animal in schools than it is in clinics and it is in home-based services. And, you know, I guess to kind of preamble this section a little bit, the level of control is, is especially in a consultative model, is absent. Uh, and even in circumstances where administrators want to uh, uh, have some behavior change of staff members, the tools that administrators have to do so are, are limited as well. It's much, much different than... Uh, you know, uh, uh, again, your your run of the mill ABA agency. You know, you just you you. Want, no one likes firing anybody, of course, but you know that that you know, it's very very difficult to do in the school setting if someone's not not performing or doing things that are harmful, which um, it, it is rare, but it does happen. Uh, I've seen it happen. So, uh, so I I just want to 
underscore those challenges before, you know, kind of launching into some of these questions here for those who aren't aware of these challenges because they, they are great and plentiful in, in these settings. So having said that, uh, Celia asks, uh, can you provide some tips on how to effectively train staff in a consultative model? And, and what are some things that make for a successive consultative relationship and conversely, an unsuccessful consultative relationship? So I do want to preface this with just one more layer to the onion. Um, unions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm so glad you said that because I <laughs> that was on the tip of my tongue. But. So it's oh. Missy at Applied Behavioral Strategy. <laughs> Um, when I moved to Connecticut, I didn't know what a freaking union was. And then I get here and I, and I find out that they have all these protections and all these rules and you can't make me do that. And that's not in my contract. And it, it certainly is a whole nother level of complexity. Um, what the unions here are learning is that an RBT is more than a para. And so they're getting compensated more and they have a few more professional expectations because the board has professional expectations for those RBTs. And, and again, I have to give a silent shout out to the district that we work with. It's a large urban um, inner city um, district. And, and I have worked so closely with that assistant director to um, continue to encourage her to encourage her staff to get those RBTs. Because it, if there's an RBT, then we know that RBT has to be supervised by BCBA. And so that's going to increase um, the quality right there. Um, so, so working with the districts at the, at the district level to help them recognize the RBT credential versus just being a para. Um, and then in, in terms of forming those relationships, what our team does is we go in and we say, you, Matt, you tell us what you need this week. And they tell us, they tell us what day they want us to come. They tell us what problems they're anticipating. They'll even say, look, you know, Johnny over here has got, a, got an IEP meeting on Friday and we really want you to be there um, to talk to the parents about his needs. And so by asking, instead of coming in and telling, um, we have found that that forms a really good relationship. And I'm just going to say again, don't go to happy hour with them. That is not a good relationship with your um, consultative colleagues. Um, there's, some, there's a question from Cherie. I think we covered already about advice relating to educators in the mainstream setting. I think we've, we've I think we've covered that by some of the relationship development strategies that you've, you've mentioned thus far. Um, so I want to move on to uh, Amanda's question here. Uh, when working in a school district, how do you keep staff morale up? Uh, I've worked in both public schools as a teacher and now in a clinical setting as a BCBA, and I'm trying incredibly hard to work on this. We've done recognition, staff reinforcement, et cetera. Uh, any ideas would be helpful. And again, I would underscore that in school settings. And if you're a consultant, you have very little control over like the, the, the aspects of uh, the working situation or, you know, and so, uh, how do you, how, what, how would you wave that magic wand? <laughs> I guess. Yeah, so I'm going to preface this by saying that I am, well, maybe you'll bring me back to talk about feeding, but I'm very passionate about what we put in our bodies, right? And I, um, I embrace a, a ketogenic lifestyle, which is a low carb, um, grain free uh, approach. And I, I say that because I'm going to tell you what I think works really well donuts and coffee. <laughs> um, when you bring teachers um, things that sort of set the mood, um, and again, is that a gift? We'd have to bring in Dr. Bailey to determine if that's a gift or if that is um, a way to get buy-in. It's an antecedent uh, uh, manipulation. Manipulation, you, you know, it sure is. And, and I, you know, we just find that when we do those nice things, that that starts with um, getting some buy-in um, because we're, we're bringing things that they value um, and helping them understand that, that many times they don't have time to get that coffee before they come um, to work. So I think the other thing that, that we have to do is remember our science. And our science says if we have a staff engaging in problem behavior, 
let's look at the function of that behavior and how we can teach replacement behaviors and reinforce replacement behaviors. And so when we talk about staff morale and why is staff morale low, well, let's do a functional assessment of why is staff morale low? What is it, why are they feeling beat up? And what can we do to find things that will reinforce them? And, and it may be that they don't want to be told they're a great teacher or they don't want to be told they're great at data collection. Maybe they do just need that donut and that coffee. Um, but until we go back to our science and do a preference assessment and find out what can we do that will make them um, feel better, um, you know, we, we, we have to start there. And I will say a huge resource in this area is Simon Sinek. Or I may not even be saying his name right. Um, he uh, is one of the leaders in the country uh, for job place happiness. His goal in life is to have every employee in the country get up, go to work, and come home feeling fulfilled at the end of the day. And so as behavior analysts, right, we're best positioned to help people accomplish that. But we have to step back, do that preference assessment, do that functional assessment, and build that reinforcement plan for the adults. Is that the start with why guy? It I'm might be. For someone else. I, I know that, that, I, I've, I've heard that name and people have recommended books of his to me, I think. Um, yeah, he has a great little This is probably people it. shouting at their phones right now. It's this, you know, like. Yeah, right. Well, he, um, he has a great little video on YouTube I highly recommend for any uh, ABA agency owner or anyone who is ultimately responsible for an employee. And it is um, Millennials in the Workforce. It's a great talk. I'm writing that down right now so I can get that in the show notes. Cool. Yeah, you know, it's funny because sometimes there's, like little, there's low hanging fruit too sometimes uh, that can enhance the quality of life and reduce the friction of, of, of service delivery as well. Um, you know, I'm reminded of a story that uh, in, in a recent episode that, uh, you know, a, um, one of the agencies here in New Hampshire uh, increased their employee engagement or decreased kind of some of the, some, you know, some, some just kind of some of the annoyance of, uh, uh, that they had by adding another refrigerator in the clinic, you know? Um, and, you know, uh, not too long after hearing that story, I, I was, um, I, I visited a clinic of an acquaintance of mine and was talking with the staff and just adding a microwave, you know, another microwave in the building or oh, the, the sign out process or whatever, uh, you know, reduces the friction reduces the aversive nature of some aspects of the day-to-day -day activities of the staff. And so, you know, um, you know, so a trip to, to Walmart or Target to pick up a, a refrigerator or a microwave uh, can pay huge dividends down the road. Absolutely. You know, I ordered and, and we wouldn't know that if we didn't have that kind of like, and, and this was all discovered through just kind of an open-ended, non-directive conversation about, hey, what is, what do you like about your job? What's frustrating about your job? You yeah. know? And sometimes well, that can go yeah. into, you know, that can get off the rails if you don't guide that conversation carefully. Absolutely. It's worthwhile well, we, having. We do a Google form. So we send a Google form out to our staff, and they've learned that that will then contact reinforcement if they'll fill it out. And so we ask them, what do you want to work for? What do you need? What would make your job easier? And so in one of our surveys, they were like, it would really be helpful if we had water delivery service. And I was like, $11 a month? Uh, yeah. Done. So they get water. So they have hot water on tap if they need to make tea. Um, and and, and there again, it was a simple strategy for us to do, and and they appreciated it. Are you looking for a new job, but you're overwhelmed with all the emails that you're getting from various ABA agencies? What if there was someone who was in your corner and could help you find the perfect job placement? Well, that person exists. Barbara Voss has been working as a recruiter for over 30 years, and her company, HRIC, specializes in placing BCBAs in permanent full-time positions throughout the United States. Barbara has been placing BCBAs since 2011, so she knows our business, and she offers personalized service to any BCBA looking for a new position. She also helps companies looking to hire BCBAs, too. Here are just some of the things Barbara can help you with. She can provide information about salary ranges in different markets across the country. She can help you write your resume. She can coordinate and prepare you for the interview process and even help negotiate the right salary for you. 
And best of all, there are no charges to any candidate for all of these services. When you are ready to make a change and want to work with someone who will listen to you and understand what you need in a new position, contact Barbara at HRIC. To schedule a confidential discussion, head over to hricolorado.com. Again, that's hricolorado.com and hit the contact button to connect with Barbara. You won't be disappointed. Yeah. Um, all right, great. So uh, we could probably go on and on about supporting staff, but I want to move on to some other things. And I, I don't want to hold you uh, all day here as well. Um, so got some questions on funding. <sighs> Okay. There, is none. there is no funding. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Jana writes, uh, she saw a thread on Facebook recently where someone posted a question about, is it ethical to provide school-based or consultation services for the same student that you provide in-home or center-based ABA services through a different funding source? And she saw widely divergent responses on this uh, topic here. What's your experience with this? What advice would you have for Janet? So my first advice is don't get advice on Facebook, although everybody <laughs> does. I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, so I think what, what everybody needs to do is make sure that they're, that they are familiar with federal law for whatever area they're practicing in. So if you are practicing in schools, then you have to know school law. You have to know special education law. You have to know FERPA, which is the Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And, and then you have to take it down one more layer and know your state law, right? So a couple of people did ask some state-specific things here. And, and because I don't practice there, I would have to go back and read the statutes. Um, but align yourself with people in your state who are experts on that the laws in your state. If you were, um, so, so that's in terms of your location and knowing your laws. The second piece is when we, where does the funding come from? And so um, I just got back from the Autism Law Summit, which is a conference I highly recommend. If you want to be a mover, it, it, they call it a, a conference of doers, um, but the movers and the shakers go there, right? You go there, you learn stuff, and you come back and you implement. Um, and that's the group of people that I think really get things done policy-wise. And so at that conference, it was a, there was a big discussion on ADA in schools as funded by health insurance. And, and what we know is that um, we have a thing called MAPIA, which is the Mental Health um, Parity Act. And we also have a thing called the ADA, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act. And we don't have time in your show to go into detail on those things, although I would love to come back and talk about MAPIA, let's say with Dan Unum or somebody. Um, but what we do know is that children have the right to access their health care services in their school setting. And so any school who tells you that you cannot, um, they are violating um, federal laws. And so you have to, um, again, you, you don't want to go in with guns blazing, but rather go in from um, a, a consultative approach and help them understand how that can be a beneficial thing for them. Now, Medicaid is its own beast. So if you accept Medicaid funding, then you are responsible for knowing federal Medicaid law and also how your state has chosen to implicate uh, to implement Medicaid services. So in Louisiana, for example, um, Aetna is responsible for the Medicaid contract. And under Aetna, you can have Aetna Medicaid home services, home and community, or Separately, the school district can request um, and then Medicaid school services. And the key is that you don't want to duplicate services. But that's specific to Louisiana. In Connecticut, the school um, can bill Medicaid um, for certain ABA services. If you're going to do Medicaid in schools, then the IEP is the document that drives those services. So the IEP has to be written to a level that Medicaid will pay for it. So again, you have to really know your state law and, and the way your state is implementing that service. Okay, and th there was a follow-up question about Medicaid, and I think you, you addressed it there. So uh, Mandy, uh, just uh, you can refer to 
<laughs> I think we got your question in the context of uh, the previous answer. So, all right, um, let's move on to some uh, clinical questions here. Uh, I've got a couple of a uh, couple of interesting questions that came in. Uh, let's see, one of them was a PBIS question that we already talked about. So let's uh, let's see. Linda wrote in. Um, does the ISCA, or which is now rebranded as Practical Functional Assessment, um, and that is the uh, the functional assessment and functional communication training system that Greg Hanley and colleagues have been writing about for the last couple of years. Okay, so does the ISCA and performing a practical functional analysis, a la Greg Hanley, meet all the federal requirements for performing an FBA and completing a BIP? If a school abandons their current policies for FBAs, is that is this doing? Uh, is, does this count as a service for maintaining compliance across state and federal levels? So, um, what are your thoughts on on that? Absolutely, this is one of my favorite things to talk about. I actually do not to plug myself, but I do have oh, plug, a, plug away. <laughs> I do have another webinar in December. I don't know the date off the top of my head, um, but it's a webinar specifically focusing on FBAs and BIPs in schools. Uh, which goes even beyond what we cover in the, in the special education law webinar. So I do want to say, Matt, when I looked at that question online, um, uh, the the asker was using the, the PFA, um, right? So practical functional assessment. But, mm -hmm. but you know, I think we have to be very careful about our acronyms because when I looked that up, I think pretty widely uh, used is PFA, which stands for protection from abuse within the courts. And so maybe we can help Hanley come up with a, a different acronym for his practical functional assessment. Because, um, you know, PBIS used to be PBS, and, and everybody was calling the PBS web, the PBS TV channel for behavior support. And They were getting Elmo. And, and they uh, kindly asked the team to rebrand, and so they rebranded to PBIS. So, so looping back around to uh, this notion of what's, what's legal in schools, my favorite legal guru is Perry Zirkel, Z-I-R-K-E-L, and I will give you a link to his blog as well. He has a free blog that you can follow. The guy is genius. He has a PhD in special education administration, and he's an attorney. And so those two things together make him just like a rock star. And so his blog has a lot of really great free resources on it. Um, in 2004, 11, I think, um, I, I reserve the right to stay corrected when I get you the article. Sure. Um, Perry published a review of all the laws on FBAs and BIPs in all the states. And it's a great review because he put it into this pretty table and outlined it state by state. How it, what is the definition of an FBA? What's the definition of BIP? When do you do FBAs and BIPs? Who does FBAs and BIPs? And how do you do FBAs and BIPs? And, and what he wanted to look at is our states um, prescribing this. And, and what he found is they're not. And so the federal, the federal courts don't define FBA and BIP either. So we only have um, Mitchell Yell published a great study where he analyzed all the FBA uh, case law. And granted, this was many years ago, and it needs to be replicated. Back then, what he found is that districts were losing in these FBA um, lawsuits because they weren't doing FBAs based on our science. And Mitchell Yale's another really great behavior analyst, but he likes to look at, at law as it relates to uh, providing services to kids. Um, so then, so Zerkel came along then and said, well, lo and behold, the states aren't defining it either. So there is no law or rule as to who can do it, when you're supposed to do it, and how you're supposed to do it. Yeah, so and I think anyone, anyone who's done some consultation in schools and has done a file review has probably seen some yeah. pretty curious things that have the title FBA at the top of it, and it's mm -hmm. really just someone like writing up a, mm -hmm. a narrative description of an observation, right. you know, with, with you know, not much in the way of any sort of conclusion whether or not it would be, you know, accuracy notwithstanding uh, or anything like that. So, yeah, some pretty scary, it, scary examples out there for, for it sure. It is scary, but I think what we have to recognize as behavior analysts, FBA first appeared in special education law in 1997, okay? Awana's functional analysis article was reprinted in 1994, 
So they reprinted that article because they didn't think that it was being implemented or had the readership that it needed in its original publication, right? So in 1994, it got reprinted in Java. Well, guess who's not reading Java? Teachers and administrators aren't reading Java. So you know they didn't read the 1994 article, yet the law got changed in 97. And so here districts were being asked to do something that they didn't know boo about. And so they did the best they could under those circumstances. And, and you know, there were a lot of people like Horner um, and, and the PBIS people who were going around training people how to do FBAs and VIPs. Um, but the problem is now we're trying to catch up with all that, those bad practices that had happened. So there is no law governing how to do it, what to do it, or who can do it. Okay. Um. Lindsay writes in an awesome question. How can we better plan for functional skills training? When do we start to back off on academic skills and focus on the skills that will enable our students to live at a higher level of independence? Boy, do I encounter that all the time. Uh, and I encounter that in the context of inclusion, uh, sometimes misguided attempts at inclusion, uh, at least in my opinion, uh, in certain cases where you know, kids don't have the requisite language skills and things like that to really benefit from you know, a, a uh, you know, some sort of uh, secondary, especially in secondary ed, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, so that's the gist of the question is basically what, um, you know, when, when, how do you guide teams to try to transition away from traditional academic or even early learning stuff that you'd seen like in an EIB, EIBI program uh, and transition towards uh, learning more you know, kind of practical daily living skills that you'd see, say, like in the uh, essential for living or other types of curricula like that? So I'm going to point us back to the law. <clears throat> so states, right, are struggling with what they have to do from an academic outcomes standpoint. So long ago, we had had the law called NICLABA, No Child Left Behind Act. Mm -hmm. Well, it got left behind and it got renamed to ESSA, which is... Um, something about student achievement. I can't remember the first two um, letters. And so there's all this pressure on districts, especially districts who have underperforming schools to perform. And at the same time, there are laws saying you can't have too many kids in special education. And so districts are left sort of thinking, well, what are we supposed to do with these kids that don't fit this academic trajectory? Now, let me flip over to what IDEA says. An idea, and I still say idea, even though there's that extra I, so the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act. Um, it has not been reauthorized since 2004. And what we know about idea is that it requires teachers to develop IEPs that consist of academic and functional outcomes, not just academic. So from day one, we need to be focusing on those um, academic and functional outcomes. And I think that schools have lost sight of that obligation to do that. And so they'll take a high-functioning child with autism who, right, it, it has a hundred and whatever IQ and is rolling through academics like it's nothing, but doesn't know how to hang up his backpack or doesn't know how to read a friend, right, or maybe stems and no one wants to, to play with them. And so we've forgotten that we have other responsibilities as well. So I would come back to our obligations under the law, which is to make sure we have those academic and functional outcomes. And, and at some point, you do have to sort of say, when are we going to make the academic outcomes also functional? Because teaching a kid to do a math worksheet is not going to do him a hell of beans a difference when he has to go and buy something at the store. Can't, couldn't agree more. Um, but uh, Lindsay, thank you for that really important question because I, I, I don't think we can overstate that. Um, so the, the last kind of broad category I want to talk about was like kind of ethical considerations. And we've been weaving a lot of uh, the, the, I think we've answered a lot of these questions in the context of our discussion already, but um, I will just throw out one general question in this category that was uh, written in um, by Sarah. And she, um, she says she left a job as a school-based BCBA because she felt like she was constantly faced with ethical challenges. And uh, I, I can see how that would happen, certainly with, 
being pulled in a bunch of different directions and things like that. So I guess a more general question is, you know, if you're a school-based BCBA, meaning like you are a, 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 an employee of a district, what, what guidance would you provide someone like that who uh, is trying to practice within the, you know, within their scope, within the bounds of ethical, you know, uh, propriety and things like that? Um, you know, how, how, what advice do you have for someone to kind of stay within those, those, those uh, parameters in the circumstances in which they find themselves in, which is being pulled out of them, or at least the, the temptation is there to, so what would you say to that more generally? So again, I, I really do not think that school districts are the best place for a baby BCBA. I feel like, um, a, a very skilled clinician needs to be in that role. I also feel like districts um, should have senior BCBAs who are um, supervising those newer BCBAs who are doing the day-to-day practice. Um, if you're, you know, solo out there in a district, it's super important that one, you've read your employment contract so that you know what you've agreed to be doing under this job. But two, form that relationship with your supervisor and educate your supervisor on our science. Um, Make sure that your supervisor has a copy of the ASD guidelines. Make sure that your supervisor has a copy of the code of ethics. Heck, buy them a book. You know, buy them one of Bailey's books or or buy them a Broadhead's new ethics book. Anything to help them understand um, the complexities of of what we do. Um, We have found that continually bringing everybody back to our science and back to the the way things are supposed to happen, um, it helps them recognize caseloads um, and it helps keep them from putting our our, uh, staff into situations that are unethical. Yeah, you know, I've seen circumstances where, you know, because someone is a BCBA, they'll, you know, a district administrator will pull them off of all the other responsibilities of what they're doing and have them, you know, joined at the hip with one particular student who's in a crisis and, you know, with, with perhaps not a quick end in sight, you know, and it's like, I want to say in those circumstances, like, you know, there's all these other kids who aren't getting services and, you know, you, you the BCBA can't just be the person running around with a walkie talkie, you know, putting out fires, you know? And so that, that's an area where I see, uh, uh, school-based BCBA is getting really, you know, they just know because they're, they're doing this, you know, crisis uh, management more than anything else. They don't have the time to service the kids on their caseload uh, more generally. Well, and I think do anything, put in things in place that are proactive in nature. You know, as we look again, I, I said this, and I'm going to say it again, just because you're practicing in the school does not free you from operating under your code. And more and more, like I think we're up to 30 some odd states that have a license. And so now your your clients and their guardians have a direct access to report you to the licensing board. And what we know from research, particularly I know with Massachusetts licensing, um, the number one um, person to complain against a behavior analyst is a client a disgruntled client. Mm -hmm. And so if you're in a school and you're not providing the appropriate services to a kid on your caseload, you best be careful because that family can report you to the licensing entity. And it, trust me, you do not want to be involved um, in a lengthy investigation into your practice. Yeah, that's uh, that's good advice. Um, While we're on the topic of advice, I think we've kind of come to the end of where we, uh, talked about, uh, talking about, I guess, <laughs> today. So, um, I know you've been providing all, all sorts of good advice throughout this conversation. Uh, is there any closing advice, any advice you have for the newly minted BCBA before we say goodbye? So my advice for a newly minted BCBA is to, um, align yourself with a supervisor or a mentor who can continue helping you grow. Um, there, there's so much to learn out there. And, you know, you and I, Matt, have been doing this a very long time. We're old, but I still have people that I lean on for guidance because I don't know everything. And, and just never forget that you will never know it all. And, and then I, I did highlight one thing that you had said earlier. Um, you know how we, we sometimes come in, guns blazing, we're the best, and, and our science is the best, and therefore we're the best. And 
I think sometimes we also say in our report that the best thing for Johnny is X, Y, or Z, but we have to remember when we're writing reports under education law that Johnny doesn't have the right to the best. Johnny has the right to the most appropriate. And so we need to think about our language and use our language around that most appropriate phrase um, to help kids get what is most appropriate for their outcomes. All right. So that is a perfect segue to remind people about your upcoming SPED law webinar and the follow-up one about writing, uh, conducting and writing up uh, functional assessments and behavior intervention plans. So um, we will have all that information in today's show notes. So boy, so many different directions we can go in and, uh, but we're going to, I think, um, put a, uh, put a pin in it for now. I uh, would love to have you back again. Cause there's so many things we didn't get to. I know you I want to talk about to come back. <laughs> I've, I've had a million people request a, a, an episode about feeding. It's an area that I'm completely clueless about. Um, just ask my kids and, uh, uh, I would love to do that as well. All right. All right. And, uh, so Dr. Missy Olive, thanks so much for joining me today. And Thank it's you. A really uh, enjoyable conversation. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.